Very latest now on all of this, ABC's Maggie Ruley is in Ukraine, Ines de la Quatera is in Poland, and Alex Perche is in Washington. So, Maggie, to you in Lviv in Ukraine there. Uh, where does it seem the Russians uh, are targeting? It looks like there's been a kind of stasis almost on various fronts. I mean, there's, there's steady, slow, minimal advance. But it, 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 where is the Ukrainian government concerned uh, that the Russians are making gains, and does it feel the same way to you that we've been kind of stuck with the same map for a while? Yeah, exactly, Terry. I mean, we know that, that there's that slow convoy slog moving towards Kyiv. Kyiv is still a major area of concern. We know the Russians are so intent on encircling Kyiv and really taking over the capital uh, that they span a few miles outside of the city. There are two airstrikes there today, one on an apartment building. Civilians were killed in those attacks. So we are seeing so much focus on the capital right now, but also on the eastern front. That also remains a really hot area with these attacks. And down south, those southern border towns, you know, they're major ports right there. It's so important for the Russians to get to control of them. It's right near Crimea. They want to go all the way to Odessa. So we're seeing a ton of fighting in places like Mariupol still. Um, those were having more strikes, more shelling, more bombings. They really have just been relentless there. That's where we're seeing those horrific photos of things like bombing on maternity wards, civilians not being able to escape, no humanitarian aid being allowed in. Uh, now, those are the three sort of main areas. But also a big concern, Terry, is this movement west. We know we've had airstrikes near the border of Poland. There have been growing concerns about airstrikes in other western cities as well. So again, the focus on the capital east and south, but definitely new growing concerns on the western front as well. Yeah, absolutely. And let's get to that on the other side of the border. Inez, in Poland, I want to ask you about uh, the strike Maggie was just talking about on a military training ground just 10 miles inside Ukraine from the border with Poland. Ukrainian officials, uh, they say at least 35 dead, 134 wounded. That's a major strike. I, I understand you spoke with some of the survivors who were foreign fighters. That was a staging ground for foreign fighters. What can you tell us? Hey, that's right, Terry. We were at a refugee center yesterday, about 45 minutes from that military base, and we were actually actually speaking with refugees who just come in from Western Ukraine when a bus uh, pulled up with a group of soldiers on board, a group of men. That in and of itself was a strange sight because it's typically women and children at these refugee centers. But on top of that, these guys were wearing uh, uniforms bearing the Ukrainian flag, and yet they weren't speaking Ukrainian. They were speaking in English to each other. So we approached them. We spoke to them. And they did tell us that they were foreign fighters, volunteer foreign fighters, who were at that military base this morning and had to be evacuated. So they described waking up that morning in a panic when the missile strikes first started to hit. We spoke to one American fighter who described the scene, and here's what he had to say. This morning we wake up, there's missiles flying everywhere. I don't know if it was um, cruiser missiles or it was an airstrike. Then we left the base. The base got bombed two more times after we left. The base is completely bombed. Oh, yeah. It was a hell of chaos. It was bombs coming from, like, left and right. You're just praying to God it doesn't land near you. And he mentioned it, but Ukrainian officials say at least 35 people were killed, 134 wounded. The Russians estimate that number is much higher. They're saying it's closer to 180 people killed. The people we spoke with at that refugee center were all foreign fighters, people from the U.S., the U.K., France, Ireland. They say that base was a hub for foreign fighters, that foreign fighters were crossing the border and then being brought to this base where they were trained and then deployed to other parts of Ukraine. And these soldiers we spoke with feel that Putin hitting that base was Putin sending a message that he's not afraid to strike Western soldiers and Western military supplies, Terry. No question. That, that, that base clearly uh, annoyed, at the very least, the Russians that other, that Americans or other fighters would come in to combat Russians, and, and he wanted to snuff that out. Uh, Maggie, I, I want to go to you on, on what almost is a positive in, in all this, and that's the, the way that President Zelensky has met this moment. Despite having a huge target on his back, we saw those pictures. He walked down the streets of Kyiv to this hospital where he met with injured sol soldiers. I'm mean, just thinking of the contrast between Putin, who's been in isolation, you know, at the end of those ridiculously long tables or remote across a vast hall. Uh, he's very close, uh, despite, as I say, you know, uh, Russia wanting to number his days in the single digits. There he is. And I want to just, I was going to ask you, if you get a sense of how his leadership has gone down with the Ukrainian people. He was struggling politically before all this. 
Yeah, that's what's so interesting, Terry. Now, though, he's a hero. I mean, you can sense it in the people here. Everyone we speak to just has this resilience, this urge to fight. You know, we spoke with one woman, a grandma, who was uh, escaping from the East. She made it here to Lviv, and, and she said she's not leaving. She's going to keep fighting. She's not going to stop this. She's looking towards the leaders, and she says, we're going to win. And, Terry, it was so interesting. I had the chance to sit down remotely with one of President Zelensky's top advisors. He's the lead negotiator here in Ukraine. He's been negotiating with the Russians. He spent all weekend with President Zelensky, and I asked him that question. I said, what is it like right now when you're talking to the president? Do we know uh, that people are after him, that Russia has tried to assassinate him, that, you know, all of those leaders are under threat right now? Uh, and he said, Zelensky is a fighter. He's never going to stop fighting. That's all he kept, kept saying to me. He said, you know, of course, I'm scared, but that's not going to stop. We have to stay here in our offices. We have to stay here fighting on the front lines because that's what the people of Ukraine expect. And we're not going to let our people, we're not going to let our land down. So, mm. you know, despite all of this threat, all of this violence, they are not giving up. And, and that leadership that uh, Zelensky is demonstrating, an intangible asset right now, it seems, for the Ukrainian mm -hmm. nation and armed forces. Uh, Alex, Zelensky is going to be here in Washington talking to members of Congress on Wednesday. Uh, what do you expect to hear, what, uh, via Zoom, of course, uh, I, I didn't intend to say he's going to be here, he'll be here via Zoom, but he'll, he will be addressing members of Congress. And what do you think he's going to be saying? Well, Terry, in that virtual address, I suspect uh, President Vladimir Zelensky will renew calls for uh, for uh, the closure of the skies. We, we've seen uh, them call for air support from uh, NATO countries, specifically the U.S. It's been a hard line. President Biden has said uh, that he uh, would not uh, uh, acquiesce to that to that request because essentially it would be the start of World War III. But today we are actually getting uh, at least one member of Congress, Senator Lindsey Graham, who who has seen. <laughs> to soften to the idea of a no-fly zone uh, in, in the region, saying that if Russia did actually uh, uh, commit war crimes, uh, which evidence is pointing in that direction, that that would justify and he would then support a no-fly zone. Something else that I suspect uh, that President Zelensky uh, will, will start to talk about uh, this Wednesday is, uh, again, this U.S. intelligence that Russia has reached out to China for not just uh, financial support, but potentially military support. And the growing concern on that front to see if there are other things that uh, the U.S. can can provide, whether they be uh, additional arms or, or money towards arms uh, to support these Ukrainian troops. Mm. And then the, there's the question. Thank you, Alex, of the of the support for all the Ukrainians who have had to flee their homes. And in as more than 2.8 million people now, we are told, have fled Ukraine so far, millions more. What can you tell us about the latest refugees who are escaping and how many more are expected? Hey, Terry. Yeah, and the numbers keep climbing. It's been interesting to see on the ground here. It's almost like there's been different waves of refugees. So in the beginning of the crisis, it seemed to be wealthier people who were coming here. They had the resources to take time off from work, to get a hotel here in Poland, wait the crisis out even before the war broke out. Then it seems that there was a second wave of people coming in from eastern Ukraine, so hard hit eastern Ukraine. That wave of people was coming in with a lot less, a lot, you know, just like a small backpack or a small suitcase maybe just pets or, or their children in their arms. Uh, but that was the second wave of refugees. And now it seems like we're starting to see a third wave of refugees coming in from western Ukraine. We were at a refugee center yesterday where volunteers, they said th they had already started to see in the last couple of days an influx in the amount of people coming in from western Ukraine. We spoke to two moms, actually, two young moms who were from Lviv. They told us they had been hoping to ride it out uh, in Ukraine. They didn't want to flee. They didn't believe the fighting would spread to western Ukraine. But then they were away yesterday by those explosions at the Yavoriv uh, military base and that's when they made a game time decision to flee so their husbands actually drove them to the border yesterday right after those explosions said goodbye to them at the border and they didn't have a plan they had just arrived in Poland they didn't know where they were gonna go uh, they were just you know fleeing in a panic so that's the concern here that we're gonna start seeing a, a, a large influx of people coming in from Western Ukraine mm. and every single one of those people has a story, a story of displacement, uh, of, of loss, of, of separation. Uh, Alex, Ines, Maggie, thanks very much for that.
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.